He kind of took off going down the street and he kept looking back over his shoulder with his hands in his ears, you know, like like a, an explosion was going to go off and it was going to hurt his eardrums or something. He got maybe 50 yards away or 80 and I yelled and yelled. I tried to get him to stop uh, and he did it. And I think at that point I was kind of like, all right, like he's not getting the hint. I tried to be nice. I tried to tell him to stop. And so uh, I stood up and took a couple shots at him. Nothing happened. He just kept on running. My initial thought was like, holy shit, did I just miss this guy from, you know, not that far away, right in front of my whole platoon. And so I think I got like more maybe just irritated or mad. And so I took a couple steps forward and got on a knee. And then I took a couple more shots and that, that finally brought him down. Christopher Basket was 19 years old when he arrived in Iraq. He'd enlisted in the Navy with his sights set on underwater demolition, but a little more than a year later, he was a corpsman doing his best to fit in with the more seasoned Marines to whom he had been attached. The thing is, when you enlist and accept your trajectory, there isn't much more you can do than go with it. As a Navy corpsman, Chris hadn't expected to be doing much fighting, but he quickly learned that combat was a school all of its own. He had like some little superficial wounds like to his neck and the side of his head and stuff, Um, but it didn't seem that bad. And then he kind of was in and out. He asked me if he could get a cigarette and I asked him where, where are your cigarettes at? And he, he looked at his sleeve because there's a pocket on his sleeve. And when he looked over, I could see he had all this shrapnel, like all on the side of his eyeball and back behind his eye and everything like that. And it was bleeding pretty good from inside there. And I remember thinking like at that point, like, okay, well, he doesn't even know that he's blind yet. You know, like here's this same thing, 19, 20 year old kid. This is one of my best friends and he's never gonna be able to see out of his stupid eye because of this IED. What is true bravery? What makes a hero a hero? Tested by the worries of what's happening at home, thousands of miles away, and the reality of what you're facing here and now. When your life is in danger every second, and it's either kill or be killed. From Wondery and Incongruity Media, this is Anthony Russo, and this is war. Hiring? Every business needs great people and a better way to find them. Something better than just posting your job online and praying for the right people to see it. ZipRecruiter knew there was a smarter way, so they built a platform that finds the right job candidates for you. ZipRecruiter learns what you're looking for, identifies the people with the right experience, and then invites them to apply for your job. These innovations have revolutionized how you find your next hire. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. Businesses of all sizes trust ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. And right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash thisiswar. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash thisiswar. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Chris describes Mexico, Missouri, the town where he grew up, as a little soybean factory in the middle of nowhere. But that wasn't what drove him to consider entering the military and, specifically, the Navy. Not directly, anyway. For a preponderance of people who enlist, there's a glimpse into a future of routine that seems unbearable. You fall into this pattern with your friends, and you can imagine it going on like that forever, which can really take the shine off the freedom of adulthood. Beyond that, there's this notion that you get out of school, you get a job, get married, and wait to die. Alternatively, there is the adventure that the military promises, always has promised. As for the decision to join the Navy, it was even less sophisticated than that. They just had the coolest uniforms. Yeah, so so they had the, the dress whites, but also, like, they got rid of the uniform for the most part, but they used to have a uniform Tom Cruise used to wear in, in Top Gun with the white short sleeve, you know, all white uniform with the white shoes and everything, you could rock that. And so after graduation, Chris found himself in recruit training in Great Lakes, Illinois, which was much easier than he expected it to be, even though he had selected the training track for recruits who wanted to be EOD or Navy SEALs. 
Mostly, the training just consisted of getting up a little bit earlier than the rest of the recruits and doing a little bit more physical training. But Chris had somehow, naively, not considered the fact that his eyesight wasn't the greatest. He had taken his entrance test wearing his contacts, and this really cost him after weeks of training. Um, at that point, they were basically, you know, it's not like they were really mad or anything. I think they were just kind of like, hey, what the hell? And so they were like, you got to go talk to a, a personnel person about your new job. So I went in there and talked to this guy, and he kind of just broke it down. I mean, I knew little to nothing about the Navy, and he told me about the jobs that were open. And I basically just picked on the spot without really any time to think about it or anything like that. So he said corpsman, and I'm like, I, I don't really know what that means. And he's like, they're basically like medics for the Marines. And I was like, oh, well, that sounds like it could be okay. You know, like I wanted to do more of that kind of stuff. Like growing up, you think about the G.I. Joe type stuff. I wanted to do that. Chris still didn't have a clear plan, but he didn't really need one. He was 18 and away from home and pretty much up for anything. And his earliest experiences in the Navy hadn't really taught him anything different. In fact, he still barely had a grip on what a corpsman was. This wasn't a kid who was burning to do anything in particular, so much as one who was willing to learn and to have new experiences. It wasn't until he got to Camp Lejeune to begin training with the Marines that the import of the vocation he chose, essentially at random, started to come into focus just a little bit more. Uh, to be a corpsman is one thing. You can, you can serve anywhere as a corpsman. Well, then you have to get a, an extra school that's like a field medic school. And that's kind of where you get a lot of time shooting and stuff like that. And basically, like, right when I got there, I felt more of kind of a sense of belonging. Like, this is where I should have been this whole time. Your instructors are kind of half Marines, half corpsmen. Uh, they're all really sharp and locked on. So you get, you know, camouflage uniforms. The Marines are being Marines, and they're aggressive, and they're yelling. And it felt more like boot camp than actual Navy boot camp did. Corpsmen can go anywhere in the Navy. Some end up in hospitals or in other static medical assignments, but some are slated for combat. Chris was sure he was among the latter, especially after his two months training with the Marines. But when he got his orders, they were a hospital assignment in Camp Pendleton. He wasn't crushed, but he was a little disappointed. He'd begun to try and imagine what it would be like as the Navy guy among a cadre of combat Marines. Chris barely was settled into his life as a hospital corpsman when he discovered that he wouldn't have to imagine what it would be like for long. As 2005 wore on, the number of troops needed in Iraq was increasing. In fact, by June, troop levels in Iraq would be at a peak that wouldn't be seen again until the 2007 surge. At that point, they were just it's so short of bodies and so many people were deploying that everybody was getting pulled. I didn't even really know anything about it. I actually went to talk to my chief about going to school. I was interested in taking a college class. And he was like, don't worry about that. You're, you're going to get deployed. And I was like, what, what does deployed mean? <laughs> He's like, if you want to talk to somebody about it, uh, you can go ask Ron Kilio. This guy's name was Ed Ron Kilio. And uh, he, he worked with me in the hospital. I knew who he was because he was kind of like loud and obnoxious, but also because he could barely walk. He had a cane from his deployment to Iraq. He seemed genuinely concerned. You know, I think he looked at me, I was young and skinny. And I think he was like worried that something bad was going to happen to me. Ron Kilio brought him up to speed as much as he could. He told him some of the tips and tricks that would get him started. And much of what he said ended up being very useful in the field. But for Chris, it was Ron Kilio's attitude toward him that would have the longest term effect. In his concern and in his prescription was a tacit understanding that there is nothing that can prepare you for caring for the injured under fire besides doing it. By the time he had been in Iraq for a few weeks, Chris would develop a kind of mantra about working on people in Iraq. You don't know what you don't know until you don't know it. Ron Kilio could tell him about people and try to bring him current on what was going on in Iraq. But this was 2005. The war already was changing on the ground, and the only way to prepare for it was to keep your head clear and to be ready to rely on your critical thinking skills. And of course, relying on your Marines. It was a lot of like, you know, the respect that the Marines are going to have for you. You know, like they're going to watch your backs and they will dive in front of a bullet for you, but they expect you to be able to save them on the back end kind of thing. It's like this mutual respect, but you had to earn it. Uh, yeah, I guess the whole thing revolves around the title doc, right? So 
when you when you go with the Marines, they don't call you by your rank or anything like that. It doesn't matter. They just call you Doc because they know when it, something happens, when the shit goes down, and they start yelling for Doc, that you're going to magically appear there and you're going to do something to save that person's life. And that was the other lesson that Chris took away from conversations with Ron Kilio and the other Navy veterans he spoke with. Rank has its place, and it is a critical piece, but there is very little that can replace respect in the field. Being attached to a Marine unit meant that everyone was going to be assumed to be very good at what they did. The Marines were good at fighting, at defense and offense, and making tactical decisions under fire. The corpsmen were good at patching up Marines. The more accurately and efficiently everyone did their job, the more the odds of survival tipped in their favor. So when Chris joined up with the 3-1, 3rd Battalion, 1st Marines, he resolved to keep his head down, and also, he resolved to be reliable. When I found out, like, about 3-1, and then that's kind of, they were one of the big, you know, leaders of the, the battle going into Fallujah. They, they kind of were the first to fight there, and they were well known for that, and very well respected. You know, a lot of those guys, I think they lost, like, 33 guys, and I can't even tell you how many guys got wounded at least once. So you already kind of know the reputation going in there, and then you check in and, and the corpsmen are already there to be, are being called doc and they already have that respect. So you feel like you're way, way behind the power curve at that point. A lot of the guys that were senior dudes, I just thought that they were like, you know, these were men amongst men, like they were invincible, they were strong and they were tough and they were fast. And, you know, there was like a bunch of cartoon characters that you see on TV that you're like, oh man, like that guy's a badass. I felt like we were going to go there. I, I knew like some bad stuff was probably going to happen, but I felt like ultimately, you know, well, whatever, we're going to be okay. Like not these guys kind of mindset, I guess. Although Chris felt like he was prepared for combat, he had no idea how underprepared he was for living and working with Marines, especially at first. Again, he is young and skinny and working with guys who have had multiple combat deployments. More than that, though, they were on all the time. Both before and during his combat tour, Chris treated many more self-inflicted wounds than combat ones, which is something that bears mentioning. To be clear, the Marines weren't hurting themselves in any meaningful way, but they engaged in the kind of roughhousing and disregard for personal safety that you might come to expect from young men who have looked death in the face over and over. It's always one of two things. It's either some kind of freak accident or you know, some kind of dumbass game was going on that the Marines were doing, and that's how they got hurt. You know, it was like, who can get hit in the forehead the hardest with a rock without bleeding kind of game. It's like out of a, you know, a cartoon where it's like Wile E. Coyote with the Acme stuff. It's like, are you really doing this right now? I remember this guy, and I happened to be walking by the truck, and he's out there, and he's only got, like, bottoms on, you know, he's got his shirt off, and he's covered in grease. He's got his feet like on the, the door sill of the, of the driver's side door. And then he's got this probably six foot long pipe wrench somewhere down like where the transmission goes. And he's pulling on this thing, you know, with all the leverage basically hanging outside of the truck and pulling with both arms. And I remember looking at that and thinking like, he's gonna bust himself in the face or whatever. I don't even think I made it into the door. And I heard this big, loud, you know, bang and pop and whatever. And he's like, oh, shit. And then everyone, of course, 20 people in a row, dog. And sure enough, I go over there. He had hit himself like square in, the, in between his eyes, busted his nose. And he looked like a raccoon for like a month. When you talk to medics and corpsmen about their off-duty patchings up, they're the stories they seem to like to tell the most. Not because they're compelling, but because they're without real consequence. So often, when you hear a Marine shouting, Doc, you're not going to be able to talk about why they were calling your name with a smile in your voice. When you see enough bleeding Marines, it's hard not to get a little wistful about the times when the blood was tied to a wily coyote antics rather than enemy fire. Plus, at some level, it's a reminder about the separation between the warriors and the healers. But before he was in Iraq for very long, Chris would cross the line enough times that the only difference for him was whether he was wielding a rifle or a tourniquet. There's no way that searching for the right candidate should take longer than the interview process itself, 
With so many people keeping their resumes updated online, finding the right candidate should be easy enough. So why are traditional search practices still so plotting? ZipRecruiter knew there was a smarter way, so they built a platform that finds the right job candidates for you. ZipRecruiter learns what you're looking for, identifies the people with the right experience, and then invites them to apply for your job. These innovations have revolutionized how you find your next hire. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. And ZipRecruiter doesn't stop there. They even spotlight the strongest applications you receive so you will never miss a great match. The right candidates are out there, and ZipRecruiter is how you find them. Businesses of all sizes trust ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. Right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash this is war. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash this is war. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. As any Marine from the newest boot to the oldest, most seasoned officer will tell you, Marines are riflemen. They train and train daily to that end to make certain that, no matter what their specialty, Marines remain riflemen. All corpsmen are not riflemen, but it only took Chris one patrol out with the Marines of the 1-3 to adopt that attitude. He took to the battle aspect of his job as if it were what he was meant to do. After all, his original plan was to be EOD. In fact, it didn't even occur to him that he might end up on a ship until after he failed his eye test. So, out patrolling in the desert, trying to keep up with the Marines was just what he had hoped it would be. Danger and the unknown and even the occasional opportunity for a little bit of heroism. Uh, we're in a truck and we're kind of just cruising along and I don't know, it felt like it didn't seem real. I kind of like looked out the window and I saw a guy with a shovel and he was kind of digging a hole and then there was another guy with a cell phone and he was pressing it like, like it wasn't working, you know, he was like pressing the shit out of the buttons and looking up, you know, like expecting something to happen. And then I was like, did I just see that? You know, like, are these, these, I just saw the people that are trying to actively blow us up 25 feet away on the side of the road. And so I told the driver, I was like, hey, stop the fucking truck. I was like, did anybody else see that? And they're like, does that guy got a phone? You know, I think all at once everyone kind of like put, put five and five together. And it was like, well, this isn't normal. Remember, there is nothing so frustrating to military service people in Iraq as IEDs. They weren't brand new anymore, but they were always evolving. Worse, when an enemy fires upon you, you have a chance to return fire. There's some satisfaction in that, but there is no retaliation you can take against a roadside bomb. Chris had already seen their damage firsthand many times, so he only took a second to enjoy watching the bomb fail to explode. So I jumped out and I was like livid, I was pissed. You know, like, this guy's got the balls to be 20 feet away and try to do this right in front of me. Yeah, so I get out of the truck, and I'm, like, yelling at him, trying to get him to stop and put his stuff down, and they kind of split ways. So I follow the guy that initially had the uh, cell phone, and he, as I'm walking up, he's still kind of pushing it. And in my head, I was thinking, like, for whatever reason, that cell phone's not working. Like, I hope it doesn't start working now, you know, so... I was kind of thinking, like, maybe it's attached to him. I didn't know where the uh, IED might have been. I didn't know if we, if our truck was on it or if he had it. Um, but I was like, I need to do something about this guy before, you know, one of us gets blown up. And so he just took off running like he was going to evade capture, you know, in the middle of the desert. There's not a whole lot of places to run. Um, but he kind of took off going down the street, and he kept, he kept looking back over his shoulder uh, with his hands in his ears, you know, like, like a, an explosion was going to go off and it was going to hurt his eardrums or something. And so I started kind of getting that like pucker effect, you know, like the back of my neck and everything like, you know, it's only a matter of time before I get blown up. And so I still don't know to this day why I didn't, but he got maybe 50 yards away or 80 and I yelled and yelled. I tried to get him to stop. Uh, and then I was like, I think I just need to shoot this guy, you know, like <laughs> he's not learning. There's people in the street even kind of like, hey, that, that white dude back there is going to shoot you, you know, like, stop running. Uh, and he did it. And I think at that point I was kind of like, all right, like, he's not getting the hint. I tried to be nice. I tried to tell him to stop. And so uh, I stood up and took a couple shots at him. And then, you know, expecting, like, a movie scene to happen, I thought he was going to 
explode or, you know, turn into a big pile of fire or something, but nothing happened. He just kept on running. My initial thought was like, holy shit, did I just miss this guy from, you know, not that far away, right in front of my whole platoon. And so I think I got like more maybe just irritated or mad. And so I took a couple steps forward and got on a knee. And then I took a couple more shots and that, that finally brought him down. As it turns out, shooting a person has more than a little bit in common with working on one out in the field. You have a picture in your head about the way you think it's going to go, but you don't know for sure until it goes that way. Chris had seen guys detonated, but he hadn't ever pulled the trigger on a person himself. For those of us who haven't shot a person or been witness to it, the only reference we have is the movies. There is a difference between real and realistic but you have to know the first to truly evaluate the second. Whatever the case, what happened next was real, but it is something you would never believe if you saw it in a movie. Took off down the street and one of the Marines caught up with me and then I just grabbed this guy and drug him back to where we were at. You know, I didn't really think anything of it. I kind of just drug him back there and put him down. And then my platoon sergeant kind of looks at him and looks at me and he's like, Doc, he's, he's not dead. And I said, well, yeah, I know. And he's like, well, you got to take care of him. And then the, I, I can't imagine the look on my face when he said that, but I was not happy. If there was any upside at all, it was that he hadn't missed. Chris found four wounds clean through the area around the guy's kidneys, and some of his guts were down the front of his shirt. But like he said, without a theatrical response, he had no reference for what shooting a man looked like. He had a reference for patching one up, though. So he got down and set to work. I just took like an old bandage and just wrapped him up. And as I was kind of, you know, I'm cutting his, his little man dress off and trying to figure out how I'm going to take care of this guy. He's just kind of staring at me. You know, he's on the ground looking up at me like, like I did something wrong. I mean, I, I guess I did, but I always wonder like what he must have been thinking at this point. And so I asked one of the Marines if they could just cover up his face. <laughs> I, didn't want, I didn't want him to keep staring at me. They got him loaded up on the truck and took him back to the base. But as they put the wounded man on the helicopter, Chris didn't like the guy's odds. The IED trigger man's pulse was really high and his skin was turning black. The corpsman felt like he had probably hit him in the spleen and, for a while, he worried whether he had done the right thing, whether he might get in trouble, whether he had let the Marines down. As it turned out, none of those things happened and he was happy for it. I started going through, I guess, uh, you know, buyer's remorse. Like, man, should I have tackled him or hit him with a rock or something? You know, like I'm going through all these really ridiculous possibilities in my head about all the stuff I should have done. Um, but it turned out that, like, most people were just really, really stoked about it because as a corpsman, you're, you know, it's not really your job. Um, and I had gotten probably one of the first kills of the whole deployment. And so... To everyone else, I was like a legend. And I was running into people that I didn't even really know, you know, and I'd see them walking down a hallway or, or something like that. I'd get, see them in passing, and they'd be like, oh, Doc, I heard you fucking killed someone. Like, that's so awesome, man. Like, hugging me like it. I'm like, I didn't realize this was such a achievement. Without context, maybe it wasn't a huge achievement. But context is everything. IEDs were killing or maiming Marines, sending them home with injuries they too might not ever recover from. They also had a way of eroding confidence. These guys weren't afraid of battle, but neither were they foolhardy enough not to take into account that too often these battles were one-sided, given over to a lone man holding a cell phone and indistinguishable from the rest of the crowd. Sometimes there's no better way to put it, but when a guy has it coming, there's a group satisfaction in that retribution because so often there was neither satisfaction nor retribution. It was late at night. It's getting close to winter, probably November something. Same old stuff, man. You're just driving along. Nothing's happening. Uh, and then an IED went off. I didn't even really react to it. You know, I think I just didn't understand what was happening. I was probably kind of halfway paying attention, probably two in the morning or something like that. My platoon sergeant is basically like, Doc, grab your shit, we gotta go. And so, in my mind, I was in a one-track mind, I grabbed my rifle and kind of took off running. I didn't even grab my med bag. I was just 
I was thinking I was going to have to go shoot somebody or something, I guess. I don't know what I, what I was thinking. I was pretending to be a Marine at that point. I saw the truck as we got closer. I could see it through my, my night vision. I could see it was like on its side and kind of smoking and everything. And I told one of the other guys to go back and get my bag because I just already, I don't know, had a bad feeling just the way that it, it was laying, these big heavy trucks, you know, I was like, that's not a good sign at all. Chris recalled the first casualty he treated in Iraq. It was a Marine who stepped on an IED, but when the victim came in, instead of being bloody and riddled with shrapnel, the Marine only had internal injuries. After that, he tried to stop being surprised by what he found and to deal with each situation as unique. Still, as he sprinted toward the explosion, he ran through his prior experiences, hoping that, at the very least, he would happen upon something he could affect. This was pretty far around, maybe like 100 meters or something like that. One of the guys, he was kind of hanging halfway out the turret uh, and the top of the truck. So the top of the truck is basically pointing horizontally at this point. And uh, I could tell something was wrong with his shoulder, just kind of the way he was holding it. It didn't, you know, just didn't look like it was in the right place or something. And apparently he had broken his collarbone or dislocated it or something. And uh, he was trying to climb his way out, but I, I think he was too big and he couldn't use his arms right. So I kind of helped drag him out and uh, started asking him, you know, I was like, where's Derek at? And I poked my head in the truck and didn't really see anything. And so I, I kept asking him and I had to get him, you know, kind of to snap to. And he finally said, he's in there. He's in the truck. I kind of remember when I looked back in there a second time, I wasn't really expecting to see him. And he was kind of in this position that was so contorted. That's the reason I didn't recognize him. He, he was kind of laid halfway on his head, but he was bent backwards like a scorpion with the, you know, his heels were basically touching the back of his, the back of his head. And he was kind of crumpled into a little ball. It just looked so unnatural that I didn't recognize him as a human at that point. I remember thinking in my mind, like that kind of like heart stopping moment, like, oh my God, he's dead. Like for sure. Like nobody could survive if they look like this. And he had a big, you know, open nasty gas on the back of his head. He kind of started m moaning and mumbling. So I was like, well, like maybe he's not dead, you know? It was like every time I had a thought, it was like getting answered that I was wrong. So I started moaning and mumbling. And so I was like, okay, he's not dead. I was like, but he's definitely paralyzed. Like there's no way his spine can be turned like that. And then a few minutes later, he st or a few seconds probably, it felt like hours to me, but he started kind of wiggling his feet, which didn't seem possible the way that he was bent up in there. But I was like, okay, well, he's not... He's not paralyzed either. And I was like, but he's probably, you know, with that big gash in his head, I was like, he's got to be, you know, brain dead or something, you know, like he's probably just kind of functioning on autopilot. Uh, and then that's when I heard him say my name. And I was like, okay, well, now I got, I got work to do for sure. As a corpsman who was always prepared for the worst, no one could have been happier or more relieved to have been wrong. Corporal Derek Alderit was alive. The challenge, though, was keeping him that way. That was one of the greatest burdens Chris faced time and again. Chris is 19 years old at the time. It's 2 o'clock in the morning in the mountains of Iraq. It is freezing and miserable. If Chris was to be successful in not doing any more damage, he would have to find a way to extract the Marine from that truck. This was a man he thought couldn't have even survived being in that position just a couple moments before. And he had to extract him from a space that was too tight to fit them both. So I kind of stripped off anything I could get off, all my armor and everything, and I just kind of dove in there and tried to get them to help me out. So I had one of the Marines try to go grab an ax to see if we could, you know, bust a window or something, but the windows are like six inches thick, so that was a failed attempt. The only real thing I could come up with was to lift him back up and out of there. And I had no real good way to do it other than to kind of like snake him upwards, I guess, and out of the truck using you know, back and forth kind of seesaw motion until I could get him backing up out of that turret hole. But I, I knew something was wrong with his neck, but I just knew, like, I wasn't going to be able to get him out any other way, and nobody else was coming in there. As You know, I'm basically standing on the passenger window in a car that's upside down. And this is how a corpsman earns his stripes. As he maneuvered the Marine up toward the driver's side door, it occurred to him briefly that help wasn't on its way, or... To put it more accurately, help already had arrived, and it was him. And that's, you know, the first thing you realize is like, okay, well, 
this was not something I was ready for. And I think, you know, like in most situations, you think like, oh, like a wreck on the side of the road. You're like, if I can't get them out, I'll wait till the jaws of life get there and then we'll put them on a spine board and this and that. It was like every ounce of me was like, this is counterintuitive. But so immediately everybody's asking me like, what should I do? How could I help? Nobody's really suggesting anything. They're more like waiting for me to act. I undid his helmet. That that head wound just started bleeding profusely. I mean, it was it was pumping out blood faster than I could do anything about it. But once I kind of had him on the ground and, and opened up, I just went to work. Started my hands kind of started working faster than my brain was telling him what to do. It was like autopilot, I think. The cold made Alderit hypothermic, which made him bleed more. Chris lost and retrieved his pulse several times as he knelt in the freezing cold, covered in the Marine's blood. In my mind, I was thinking, like, this dude cannot die sitting in my lap. Like, I'll never, I'll never be able to get over this. And so I, I was like, hey, we need that, you know, medevac, like, right now. And uh, my platoon sergeant said, yeah, it'll be here in 50 minutes. And I said, yeah, Roger, 1-5. And he said, no, 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 5-0. And I'll always remember like the sinking feeling that I felt in my chest when I was like, like 15 was too long. 15 was 14 minutes and 45 seconds too long. 50 minutes was like an eternity. I want to tell you a story about Bomba socks. You know when you put on a quality piece of clothing and can tell right away? That was my experience with Bombas. They have a weight and a texture that lets you know exactly how they're going to feel right before you put them on. That's cool, but it isn't even the coolest part. For me, the coolest part was the honeycomb arch support, which not only feels like an all-day foot massage, but also makes your socks feel like they fit better. Because they do. Bombas was founded with the mission to donate socks to people in need. Because you can't donate used socks, socks are the most sought-after item in homeless shelters. The folks at Bombas knew that the only way to support their mission was by selling a lot of socks, but instead of going super cheap, they went high quality, and it paid off. So far, Bombas has donated more than a million socks, and they're just getting started. They sent me a pair of socks called Americanos, which are ankle socks that are just a half step below slippers, comfort-wise. I ended up buying a bunch more for myself, for my wife, and for my kids. For every pair of Bombas socks you buy, Bombas donates one pair to someone in need, and if you purchase the Americano socks specifically, They'll donate a pair to a homeless vet through their partnership with the VA. It's super cool that they're doing this, especially since the socks are worth it all on their own. You can check out the Americano socks front and center on bombas.com slash this is war. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash this is war. You can also save 20% by visiting bombas.com slash this is war. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash this is war. And entering the offer this is war in the checkout code space. The medevac had finally come and taken Alderet away to safety. Chris had treated a lot of Marines in the three months he had been in Iraq, but he always had ridden back with them. This was the first time he sent one away and had no control after. He stayed with the radio, waiting for word, and when it came, it was almost too much to bear. You're kind of just hovering over the radio. It's like you're waiting on a phone call to find out he's okay, but they they got him there and they, they got him into surgery and they were able to save him. He's still here today. I think it was like an overwhelming, like half and half. Like I was so, so relieved and thankful. And uh, at the same time, I was like still decompressing from like the whole thing. You know, I was, I was 19. I didn't really know what the hell I was doing, honestly. And uh, one of my, my buddies came up and was like, hey man, are you okay? And I just like completely lost my shit. Just kind of let, had to let all the emotions out about. I think I was terrified and thankful and happy and afraid all at the same time. Happiness and fear are the after effects of reacting on impulse. For example, after his first combat encounter, in which Chris grabbed his rifle rather than his med bag, thinking he was being called on to fight rather than to heal, he had learned to disregard doubts about his capability and his learning. It was an attitude that served him well for his entire tour. Act in the platoon's best interest and everything will come out all right. As an older man, even though he sees the flaws in this rationale, he also knows that it likely was not just part of his success, 
but it also perpetuated his luck. I remember we were driving along as probably midnight or something like that. I could see like this. It looked like a like a string or something, but it was it was green, like like fishing line, but but glowing. And like basically right as I saw it, uh, an IED went off and, you know, the huge blinding explosion and everything. And I was like, what the hell was that? And so this truck that got hit just ended up like veering off into the desert. It was clear that nobody was driving it anymore. Chris grabbed his bag and left from his own truck to give pursuit. By the time the truck slowed to a roll, he had chased it about half a mile. He was winded and cold as he and the other Marines who also had given chase brought the truck to a stop and went to work on its occupants. The driver was unconscious but otherwise unhurt. The passenger, a friend of his named Mark Grabowski, looked to have just some minor cuts when Chris pulled him out of the vehicle and started checking him for injuries. He had like some little superficial wounds like to his neck and the side of his head and stuff, but it didn't seem that bad and then he kind of was in and out. He asked me if he could get a cigarette, and I asked him where, where are your cigarettes at, and he, he looked at his sleeve, because there's a pocket on his sleeve, and when he looked over, I could see he had all this shrapnel, like, all on the side of his eyeball and back behind his eye and everything like that, and it was bleeding pretty good from inside there. And I remember thinking, like, at that point, like, okay, well, he doesn't even know that he's blind yet. You know, like, here's this same thing, 19, 20-year-old kid. This is one of my best friends, and... He's never going to be able to see out of his stupid eye because of this IED. As it would turn out, Grabowski would keep both his eye and his eyesight. The next time Chris saw Alderit, the Marine he found twisted at the bottom of an overturned Humvee, he was walking along under his own power stateside. During his tour in Iraq, time and again he would be sure of the worst, only to find out, happily, that he was wrong. More than that, though, every time he was wrong, Every time he averted crisis intentionally or accidentally, it was one more thing he knew how to deal with. Another weapon in his life-saving arsenal. What, what do you not know? And, and I think I said it earlier, like you don't know what you don't know until you don't know it. How can, I, how can I prepare myself for something that I don't even have the slightest clue of? Like, are you ready to go do something you've never done before in a place you've never done it with people you've never done it with? Yeah, of course. Why not? I'm ready. Really, though, what other answer can there be? Whether you're a 19-year-old corpsman with three months on-the-job training or a 25-year-old on your fourth combat tour, it is critical to remember that help is not coming. Asking the questions with specifics only makes them more ridiculous. Are you ready to patch up a guy you shot after he failed to blow you up? That kind of question is only vaguely serious in retrospect. It's a lot like the difference between real and realistic. When you say you're ready for anything, you mean it, even though you don't know you mean it until you've demonstrated that you were ready to deal with the horrible as well as the absurd. And the only place that you can do that as a kid is in combat. It's hard to explain like the level of, of respect and, uh, I guess, trust and faith that the, the government puts into you, especially as a medic you will never in any other circumstance probably be in this situation. You know, there's, there's really no such thing as like a 19 year old paramedic, you know, roaming the streets of LA doing gang shootings and stuff like it just doesn't happen that way to have all these lives in your hand. And, and literally I was the only corpsman for that platoon for 42 guys. So it's like now the weight of that, when you think about that, it's enormous. It's huge. During the seven or so months of his deployment, Chris treated Marines and civilians while participating in nearly 80 convoys. No Marines died under his care, and he found himself unable to rest. Each success made him something between confident and superstitious about going out on patrol. Chris wasn't quite afraid that he would miss out on some action, although that had to be part of it. It was just that he had caught on so quickly to the subtleties of combat medicine, and he genuinely believed he was making Marines safer. I got pretty used to it right away, and I think in my head I was more like I wanted to be there because I was afraid that something would happen with my guys and I wouldn't be there. So if there was an opportunity for me to go and I could go, then I was going to do it. I was volunteering for anything, like, hey, can I go? I'll go out again. Like, it's cool. You know, like, let me know if you guys need anything. It was just kind of, I was probably like a, 
annoying gnat at a barbecue just floating around everyone trying to get part of the action, but I felt like a real sense of belonging and like I like I was needed. And they were they were happy to have me, so it was a good relationship. As his tour came to an end, Chris was ready to head back home. After more than seven months in the desert, he and the Marines were exhausted. Time didn't have a lot of meaning for them anymore as the tour swung on a pendulum of absolute and utter boredom and crisis. Plus, at the same time, they all felt as if they had used up any and all of their allotted good fortune. I wanted to get back and kind of like live the life of a normal 20-year-old, you know. I'd, I didn't get to do a lot of that stuff. Like, I tell people all the time, they're like, oh, I remember this song or remember when this movie came out. But when you're gone like that, like, you don't. Like, you know, you're not listening to the radio and the top 40. Uh, you're not You're not watching all the cool movies that came out. It's like somebody just erasing seven months of your life that you, and you never got to do it. So it's hard to explain to if you haven't been there before, but that's the best way I can explain it, right? If, you're move, if your life is like a movie reel, if I just cut out seven months in the middle of it, that's how it would feel. Chris had been awarded the Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal for all the work he did under fire. He went home, celebrated, and then requested an attachment that would take him to Afghanistan. He had learned more treating the wounded in Iraq than he ever had learned in the school that qualified him to do the treatment, and he really felt as if he could save lives there. But his unit never made it back, at least not with him. After several months training in the Middle East, just outside of the war zone, Chris got a new assignment. It seems as if he wasn't the only one who noticed a gap between what corpsmen were trained to do and what they were expected to do. The Navy was starting a new program to correct that and, based on the amount and diversity of his combat deployment, Chris was tapped for a teaching position. It's one that he holds to this day. One of the students showed up one day and I was kind of sitting in that office, in the training office, and he kind of came walking in and I I recognized his face. I didn't didn't know who he was right away because at that time, you know, we were just getting a lot of students through and trying to train a lot of people the best we could. But I, I remembered him as a student and I was like, holy crap, man, you're back, you know? And he was like, yeah, you know, it was it was a rough tour over there. I wanted to come by and say thanks and this and that. And we're, we're kind of talking across my desk. So then it comes, you know, after 20 minutes or so, we're done talking. He's like, yeah, I don't want to keep you. So I get up to, to walk over and hug him, and I realize he's missing a leg. And, uh, you know, he had, he had lost his leg on that deployment. And then here he was standing in front of me telling, thanking me for, for teaching him stuff that I had, you know, not really considered... I knew it was important, but I, I hadn't seen the absolute direct results of it until that time. Knowing that now, it's super prideful and crazy to think about that, like, man, I don't know if my training or if my words or my whatever directly led to him, you know, being here today. But if it did, then I don't know if there's anything you could be more proud of than that. Christopher Baskett saved dozens of lives as a corpsman in Iraq, and probably many more than that as a teacher. But as the days of constant mass casualties start to fade, he still struggles to impart upon new corpsmen the seriousness of saying you're prepared for anything and meaning it. But the trouble is, for them, just as it was for him, you only think you mean it. Chris was underprepared to be a corpsman. He was underprepared to be responsible for 42 Marines, and he was underprepared to come upon scenes of carnage and act as if it was just what he expected to find. As it turns out, not knowing what you don't know can be your greatest asset, and being able to act in spite of that fact can lead you to some of your greatest achievements. Next time on This Is War. And when I wake up, I snap my eyes open and there's just blood everywhere. And I push myself up off the ground and I look at my driver who looks at me and gasps with a look of horror on his face. And he got to me and I was saying, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. And he, the only thing he could do is scream Corman up. Subscribe to This Is War on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you're listening right now. If you're listening on an iPhone, just say, Hey Siri, subscribe to This Is War. For show notes and more information, simply tap or swipe over the cover art. You'll also see offers from our sponsors. Please help support our shows by supporting them. 
Another way you can help support This Is War is by giving us a five-star rating and review, or by following This Is War on social media. And be sure to tell your friends and show them how to subscribe. Are you a combat veteran, or do you know one with a story to tell? Reach out to us at stories at thisiswar.com with your dates and branch of service and a brief description of the story you'd like to share. I'm Anthony Russo. This Is War was produced by Incongruity Media. Executive producer, Hernan Lopez for Wondery.